Good morning. It's time for Daily Chapel. The text is John chapter 3, verses 1 through 17. The Reverend Dr. John Seas is preaching. The broadcast of Chapel is underwritten by LCMS International Mission and Ministry to the Armed Forces. Reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. John, the third chapter. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know from where it comes or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know, and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Thanks be to God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Nicodemus is a Pharisee, a ruler of the Jewish people, a member of the Sanhedrin, but his name is plainly Greek not Hebrew, and it means champion of the people. Someone had high aspirations for this kid and sent him to school, wanted him to make a place for his people in the lingua franca world of power and politics. John 7, alone among the Jewish rulers, he sort of sticks up for Jesus in his own terms, asking if their law, the Jewish law, indeed will condemn a man without a hearing without even learning what he does. He seems, though, still to be among those who will only go so far with Jesus, let they be put out of the synagogue, lest they be canceled, so to speak. John 19, then, we spy him a last time, joining closet disciple Joseph of Arimathea to bury Jesus, himself bringing 75 pounds of myrrh and aloes, burial spices. We know not whether in a simple sympathy or from guilt or from faith in the one soon to rise. Not a bad guy, this Nicodemus, as guys go. But then there's Jesus, who does not fit politely into the lingua franca school of world power and politics or neatly into anything. Not because he is dull, no, or not winsome enough, but because he is God and does not care to fit in. He wills something else entirely, something far higher, as his name says, to save his people from their sins. And in that vein, let's look at this conversation. We find Nicodemus plying diplomacy by night, maybe hoping to win Jesus for his fellows, or maybe even his fellows, for that Jesus he might be able to sell to them, he comes and he speaks, I think presumptuously, for all his ilk, the rulers of Israel. We know you, he says. And 
starts to file Jesus in a pretty nice cubby. You think you're a rabbi. God is with. But Jesus, not fitting in, will have none of it. Only the begotten from above, which is a better read, I think, than born again, he says, can see, can realize, can enter into, can really enjoy the benefits of the kingdom of God. That is, don't file me yet, Nick. I will not fit where you are fixing to put me. I am not of your world. An off-putting statement, sure, but true. Well, Nick grasps at some more intellectual straws drawn from some Torah, some philosophy, a lot of sense perception, the unrelenting way of the law, and one darn thing after another. All he can come up with is this, born again? How can a guy possibly start over? How can one really reboot? So Jesus makes yet more plain. Water and spirit. Be baptized, Nick, that's how. We're talking another kind of life, Nick, that you understand, that starts at baptism. Don't sweat this born from above. Listen, he says. Again, reading a little differently. The Spirit blows where he wants. And you're hearing his voice right now, Nick. You don't understand whence he comes or whither he goes. Nick is even more flummoxed. How is it possible for any of this to happen? Baptism to new life? Hearing the revealing voice of the Spirit? Instead of laboring to tease out, working out who God is analytically, like dissecting a frog or building a model? Wild! Nick wants plans, engineering drawings, metaphysics, to judge how and whether for himself this might work. But Jesus, after essentially telling Nick he wouldn't understand them if he saw such, tells him exactly not only how this will be possible, but how it is about to be accomplished. The Son of Man, he says, must be lifted up upon the cross, that is. And whoever believes in him shall have eternal life. And then that this lifting up of God's Son is the way that God has loved the world. Now I want you to imagine, because it's true, because Jesus has on his mind higher things, that this is not some cute academic back and forth, not some divinely inspired rabbi toying with his intellectual prey. But it is our Lord Jesus telling this Nick just about as plainly as he ever did what is the real deal including what we call the nutshell gospel of John 3.16, but also the one baptism of regeneration and for the forgiveness of sins. He gives him the catechism, the creed, whole, entire, straight up, uncontextualized, unmixed, unadulterated, unsoftened, because faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ, and because the faith in Christ that alone saves is what Christ wants for everyone, even Nick's as they come to stuff Christ in some old box. For the Spirit blows where he wants, even into polite society and high scholarship and low gutters, and men hear the voice, the living voice of Jesus, the shocking voice of Jesus, the word of God, the gospel of truth, that calls them from everything they have been to something entirely other from an all-too-fleshy life of one darn thing after another to the eternal life of God, even in the here and now, who is spirit. From being bound to sin to the forgiveness of sins. To die to sin and wrath and the stingy frittering away of men. To rise in the righteousness and boundlessness of God. That is, to live by faith. This is no word game, my friends. This is truth. Now, there is a Nick in each of us, I think, The Nick's all around. The Nick in each of us comes at God with the only hammer he's got, so God must be a nail, right? That Nick needs to be drugged regularly where the Spirit blows as he wants, where his voice, the living voice of Jesus, is to be heard. To us, too, after 
after all, with our degrees from the lingua franca school of how we think things work, as we pelletize the Jesus we think we know to fertilize whatever we want to be about anyway, as we try to go on finding the bulk of our identity, our security, our meaning in our own ways and means and muscles and our glory among men. To us, as we do all that, it needs to be said that the only one who's begotten, or that only the one whose begottenness is of water and the Spirit, that is, whose identity, whose security, whose meaning are found entirely in Christ and in His Father, only the one who lives by faith can really see the kingdom of God. To us, too, when we feel unloved, both of men and of God, it needs to be said that in this way God has loved the world in the lifting up on the cross of His only Son, and that is enough more than enough in itself. All that the nick of you needs to hear from time to time, maybe sometimes in the nick of time. Around us, too, there are nicks all around. They all have their various toolboxes, but we are with them and in their midst. Nick comes to Jesus. He speaks for a we. Pharisees, Sanhedrin, who knows? Who's in your we? for whom you are the one going alone to Jesus. This word is for them too, this plain word of Christ, which may make as much sense to them as it did to Nick, but what of that, oh, what of that? It's a curious and hopeful thing Jesus says, right after he says that the Spirit blows where he wills and that you're hearing his voice right now, if you take it my way, even if you don't know where from or to where it's uh, where it's going, to what end. Jesus says after that, so it is with everyone begotten of the Spirit. And I think there may be two sides to that. One, that you yourself are saved by a word that you at first could not have comprehended. Of the God who died for the sins that kept you from Him and rose, ascended, filled all things to save you now by faith alone. Now you, are baptized by water and the Spirit. You are now in the know. You are begotten of the Spirit so that the incomprehensible but indispensable has comprehended you. But maybe there is this other sense, too, that now that you are one of those that Jesus has entrusted himself to you, that the Spirit means to speak the indispensable and incomprehensible Christ now through you, the Spirit blowing through you where He wants to go. Where those words are from when you speak them, your nicks won't know, but you do, and also where that conversation goes. John's Gospel in the end leaves us hanging about old Nicodemus and what he thought in the end. The Son of Man lifted up for his sin, buried with his spices, risen from the dead. John does not leave us and our nicks to hang on nothing or on Nicodemus' private fate. But he leaves us hanging where all life must hang, on the death of Jesus for all sin, on his resurrection from that death, on this being at the same time, this death and resurrection, the righteousness and the love of God. And at the end of the day, our conversation of we and ours and all our thought and talk are found to be hanging there. That we are hanged well. And I would say we know where from and to what end. In the holy name of Jesus, Amen.